For our next conversation, please welcome front office sports reporter Margaret Fleming with the CEO of Teton Ridge, Deirdre Lester. All right, hi everyone. Hi, Deirdre, how are you? Thanks for being here. I'm good, Margaret. Awesome. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, so we're talking about Western sports. Western, country Western is having such a moment right now. I mean, from Yellowstone to not even country artists, Beyonce and Post Malone putting out albums this year. It's just having such a moment and Western sports are absolutely a part of that. Um, but I think a lot of people in this room might not be completely familiar with what Western sports even is. You know, a little bit of rodeo, a little bit a lot more than just rodeo. So can you explain for us a little bit, just when we say Western sports, what do we mean? Yeah, absolutely. Well, hello everyone, nice to see you all here. Um, I'm Deirdre Lester, I'm the CEO of Teton Ridge, and um, I may know some of you or not, but I've worked predominantly in traditional uh, sports over the years. Um, so Western, you know, I've been here in this role for about a little over 10 months, and it's, it's still relatively new to me, and what's been, what mind blowing, to be honest, is is actually how how significantly large Western sports is, not just domestically um, or in North America, but around the globe. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but Western sports is everything from rodeo to performance horse um, disciplines like cutting and reining that you see in shows like Yellowstone that have popularized those things. Um, bull riding, if you're familiar with the PBR, they've had uh, a really great. Um, you know, run lately and, and front office just did a really great piece on their uh, team's event out at the Barclays Center uh, in August. So, I mean, it really runs the gamut of a lot of different um, disciplines within uh, the Western sports genre. Um, we predominantly, we, we kind of partner with all of those, right? So we have sports we uh, properties we own, we have me media properties we own and operate that cover all of the breadth of Western sports. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about where Teton Ridge fits into all this. Teton Ridge, uh, sponsor of Tuned In. Thank you very much yeah, glad um, to be here. for helping make this happen. Um, so you have a lot going on. You have teams that you own. You have events that you own. You have something akin to college game day. Let's break down, first of all, just kind of what you all do and especially your big event in Texas every year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Teton Ridge is a portfolio, a variety of different uh, Western sports and lifestyle assets. That's, um, you know, on one side of the coin, that's intellectual property, sports properties that we own and operate and are scaling. Uh, and then it's media assets that we are building, scaling, and partnering on um, with um, other distributors. So that's, um, those are the two avenues that we're really looking to grow to really reach um, the entire Western sports audience and also to grow and elevate that audience as well. In terms of our uh, owned event, the American Rodeo, um, if you haven't heard of the American Rodeo, uh, it's essentially, I, I liken it to the US Open um, for, for a, probably the most closely aligned uh, professional sports analogy. Um, we acquired the American back in 2021 um, it, was a, it was a single weekend event, uh, kind of a pros versus Joes format. So we invite the top five athletes from all of the major rodeo disciplines that compete at the national finals rodeo. Um, and they come and participate in the American. But then throughout the year, uh, there's a tournament of um, amateur events going on where you know, athletes that are sort of looking to make the cut, it's sort of like the PGA, right? Um, can qualify into uh, participating in the American and have a shot at competing with the best athletes in the world. And for those contenders, uh, they are eligible to be, uh, if, they, if they're able to win at the American, they're el eligible for a million dollar prize pool. So it's a very big um, life-changing money event for these athletes. Um, and in the time that we've owned it, we've um, really e elevated the, the rodeo production quality, the distribution, we're now partnered with Fox, so in April of next year we'll be live on Fox, and then our regional events that lead up to the American, the qualifiers, will all air on national TV as well through that partnership, as well as live on streaming platforms. Um, so that's a little bit about the American. Uh, we're very excited because this year, going into 25, um, will, be the, will be the first year in a long time that a, um, Rodeo will be broadcast on national TV. 
Uh, last year we were on, on Fox, but we were not live. So this year we were able to secure a live window on Fox, which would be a big thing. Uh, last year we drew about six million cumulative audience over the course of our contender series through the American. Yeah, why was Fox the right partner for the American Rodeo? Great question. Um, we looked at all of the major broadcast partners and sports partners um, when we were looking at where to take the American. And, um, and just so you know, it was acquired in 21 from an entity called Rural Media Group, which owns the Cowboy Channel, which we love the Cowboy Channel. They're a cable, uh, cable operator. They are in 20 million homes, predominantly in rural America. But we really felt like the American deserved, um, given the, the level of production that we're putting into it and the interest and the, and the prominence within Rodeo, that it deserved a national broadcast audience and opportunity. Um, Fox was a great partner for us because, one, they were willing to invest with us in doing a long-term partnership, so it was a three-year partnership. Um, this property had sort of been kicked around every year to a different network, sort of time by here, time by on CBS, and while those were great, um, we really wanted a place that we could build with. Um, also, Fox has their cable nets, so FS1 and FS2, and they gave us space to air um, our, our, our regional events on those networks, uh, so that was great, because uh, those had never been televised. Um, and they were new, we've added, uh, we continue to add events. Um, and then the other thing that we really loved about Fox was the synergy with some of the other sports programming on their network. So all of the sports nets have you know, been here today talking about, although Fox has not been here, but they've been here talking about uh, their lineup of programming. And what's great about Fox is there's some synergy with audiences that we see some overlap and opportunity for growth. NASCAR in particular, our event last year was mid, early to mid-March. Um, Fox was promoting and doing tune-in and lead-up through uh, the Daytona 500 and the first uh, handful of, of NASCAR races. They also have bass fishing on their cable nets and some other programming that we thought was a good way for us to, you know, to promote tune-in to our event. So that's a lot about Fox and, and why we partnered with them. Yeah, and you have the national broadcast going, and that is big for expanding this board. But you're also doing, I think, really interesting things. Um, I mentioned this sort of college game day-like um, show, going yeah. to different road trips, rodeo road trip, uh, going to different rodeos, and doing, you know, setting up, interacting with fans. Um, we've done about three so far this year. Tell us a little bit about how that works. Yeah, yeah. So a big part of rodeo and why we wanted to be here today at Front Office Sports at this Tuned In event is because. I'm going to guess, I don't know, I can barely see you all as the lights, but I'd say raise of hands of how many people in the room have been to a rodeo. Oh, well, oh, that's, that's a lot. good. Wow. I'm glad to hear that or see that. <laughs> um, well, um, you know, the PRCA, which is the sanctioning body for nearly 800 rodeos that happen in North America annually, um, they um, have some, you know, there's, there's 800, but there's also sort of the top tier that are sort of their flagship rodeos. So I'll name a few that we were at this summer, Calgary Stampede, uh, Cheyenne Frontier Days, and actually uh, today is day two of Pendleton, which is out in Oregon. And these are iconic rodeos that draw hundreds of thousands of fans and families, which is one of the things I love about rodeos, is very much a family occasion. And those rodeos will go on for some of them 10 days to two weeks. We are dropping into that environment, which is like a festival meets a carnival meets a rodeo um, with a show that is akin to a ESPN college game day like experience. We're piloting that this year and then looking to take that on the road to more uh, prominent rodeos and even globally next year. And we're also doing uh, the pre-show at the PRCA national finals in Las Vegas for 10 nights um, for the NFR. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit a little bit about the audience. You said families. Um, you're you know attacking it in the broadcast, in the road trip, in social media. You're going hard trying to um, you know partner with some athletes and some younger athletes to see if they can put out content as well. Um, I think what you're doing in the media space is really interesting, and I want to hear a little bit about sort of this idea of Western culture is. Here, it's growing, but it's also here. We were speaking a little bit about the concept of a niche audience or a niche sport. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, yeah, I love this topic because, you know, how do you define niche? And like, I don't know where everybody else's mind goes, but when I hear the word niche, my mind immediately goes to small, but rabid fan base, right? 
we have the rabid fan base, but we're anything but small rodeo, right? So what we're trying to do is wrap our arms around all of it. Obviously, we have our own properties. We own the American, but also several other sports properties and, and also properties that we're developing. Um, but also then partnering with the PRCA. So we're an official partner of the PRCA. We're obviously creating a lot of shoulder programming around their main, main events. Um, and then you know, looking to partner internationally with rodeos so that they can bring their athletes to the United States to participate in things like the American. So niche to me, you know, again, I think it, I guess some people might think niche is you're not the NFL, the NBA, MLB, and the NHL, and now the WNBA seemingly. Um, but I think that you know, it's a topic of conversation around like, well, what is niche and is niche emerging? You know, is it pickleball where it just showed up on the map you know, within the last decade and now it's all the rage? Um, rodeo is actually one of the oldest sports in America. Um, and so it's been around, it's the games the Cowboys played. Um, and while it has evolved and there's been different iterations, um, and in 1948, uh, the WPRA was formed. We'll talk a little bit about women in the sport of rodeo, but uh, it's the oldest women's professional sports organization that exists in the country. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an age old sport, but the popularity around it right now has never been as hot as it is with more casual fans. Um, you mentioned Yellowstone, like that definitely has an impact. I think there's a lot of things about just a uh, desire from consumers or fans to reconnect with the culture, the American culture, the cowboy way of life, you know, the, the ranch lifestyle, and rodeo is part of all of that. And to see that these athletes are competing in rodeos but living a lifestyle that is like very compelling to people, I think is drawing a lot of what we call the cowboy curious audience in. Yeah, absolutely. And the audience is actually like it really runs the gamut. Like I mentioned families, like Athletes are competing from a very young age through high school and college, and then obviously onto the professional level. Um, and when you go to a rodeo, what you see are families in attendance. You know, the PBR is interesting because I think that they're really going after that like millennial Gen Z audience and they're getting them. Or you go to the PBR here, a lot of people ask me, oh, I've been to a rodeo. I went to the PBR at Madison Square Garden. I'm like, well, that's not a rodeo, but it is, um, you know, a, a Western sports event. And it's got that like party atmosphere that's going on. Uh, the event they just had at the Barclays Center was pretty epic also. Um, but rodeo is a little bit more family centric in that people bring their kids and a lot of them go to these bigger rodeos in an RV and stay for a week. Um, so it's different in that sense that for us in terms of the media and how we distribute content, we really have to be touching on all the different touch points. And I think you know, it was really fascinating to come in this morning and hear Burke Magnus at ESPN or Mark Lazarus at NBC, and then followed by Roku. And I know YouTube is, is here today uh, following this conversation. You know, I believe we have to be in all of those places because, you know, and even cable, which someone earlier made the comment that cable's sort of the odd man out. Well, in rural America, where the endemic core rodeo fan is, they are still tethered to that cable TV more so than in other places. And so we need to be in all of those places. That's challenging, but I think it's the big opportunity. And a big part of why we partner with Fox is because they have the broadcast network and they can reach the masses. But then we are also streaming events every week. We have some smaller properties we own, like Better Barrel Racing. Um, and there's thousands of barrel racers all around the country competing in events. And we're live streaming those and we're getting anywhere from 5,000 to 8,000 viewers on a, an average weekend. And those events aren't even really produced for live streaming. It's almost like just moms and grandpa, grandmas wanting to watch their kids. So it really spans the gamut. And then social media is really allowing us to kind of celebratize the athletes, um, showcase these events that are really like eye-catching, even if you don't know exactly what the rules are, or what you're watching, um, and sort of educate and entertain a broader audience. Yeah, yeah. You spent four years at Barstool as CRO, growing you know, that company in, in a lot of ways. Thinking about the growth and the opportunity here, how many people are tuning in, even if it's not on the biggest platforms yet, where do you see in a few years just Western sports, yeah, yes, the, the media aspect of it, but just kind of you know, the attention of it nationally given the wave that we're seeing right now. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting you mentioned Barstool. We didn't talk about that, but one of the things that I always say to people in, when they ask me about the comparison of these two roles, and for anyone that doesn't know, 
I was formerly the chief revenue officer at Barstool Sports. And Barstool, we grew a massive audience and a massive business without ever having any live sports rights. And here are, are you know, and they did that all through digital and social platforms, never on really, predominantly never really on anyone's linear network. Um, here we have an opportunity where there are a ton of events. Like I mentioned, the PRCA alone has almost 800 events annually. Um, we have our own events. The PBR has their own events. There's just a lot of content out there. College rodeo, national high school rodeo. Um, so we are in the business of you know, capturing the rights and also building shoulder programming like we talked about. Um, and building the network of the future for Western sports. But that network is not gonna live on one linear place or one streaming platform. It's truly gonna be distributed anywhere where fans are consuming content today. And that allows us to reach the, the broadest audience, including globally. Um, rodeos from around the world are calling us today, asking when is the rodeo road trip coming to us, which is our game day like show, or how do we make our rodeo in Brazil. Brazil, Bejedos Brazil just hosted this August their rodeo. It's two weeks long and it's the largest and most attended rodeo in the world. And what they made one of the nights of their rodeo dedicated to the American so that their athletes could qualify into our event um, and come and compete in the American rodeo. Yeah. And you so I think it's a global platform and it's untethered and it's on all of the various distributions, which is hard but I've seen it done before and I believe we can do it. That's the right attitude, yeah. yeah. You mentioned before women's sports, we've been talking about it all day, let's keep talking about it. Uh, rodeo is, or Western sports is really interesting in that they're competing at the same event with the same rights for the same prize pool. Explain to me a little bit about the opportunities for women and men, male, women and male athletes together at Western sports. Yeah, it really struck me when I came to Teton Ridge that, you know, Again, I, I've been to rodeos before, but not really paying attention to the sport, just sort of more as like a fun night out. Um, and the fact that women in, in rodeo are not competing, I mean, there are women's only events for sure, and we love those and we're gonna create more of them. But when you go to the national finals rodeo, when you come to the American, some of the biggest events in the world, the men and women are competing at the same event, on the same, in the same arena, uh, for the same prize money. That's really unheard of in any professional sports. Um, and I don't necessarily think that story has been told or celebrated. So that's a big opportunity for Teton Ridge from just working to tell those stories and shine a light on that um, and elevate women in, in the sport. There are, there are disciplines in rodeo uh, that are predominantly male or female, right? If you go to a bull riding event, you're gonna predominantly see men riding bulls, although we were just you know, backstage and looking at stats around some of the up and coming uh, female bull riders. Um, power to them, that is definitely a very dangerous sport for women. Um, but then there are also female driven sports like barrel racing, which when you come to a rodeo, one of the things that also struck me is when the barrel racers come out, the whole arena lights up. Everybody loves it because it's horses, beautiful horses running fast with like awesome badass cowgirls on them. Um, and that's, you know, we've done some audience research around the American and seen that, you know, be the three top most, it, it fluctuates every year, but the three top sports that are the most popular at the NFR and at the American are uh, bull riding, bareback riding, and barrel racing. So the women are right up there at the top. Uh, there's a newer um, discipline called breakaway roping where women are riding out and roping a calf and then the rope breaks away so they don't have to actually get down in the dirt and wrestle the calf to the ground and rope it. Um, but um, that's a predominantly female sport, but there are men doing it, right? So there's an equal opportunity in both. It's just that different genders tend to gravitate towards different disciplines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's finish on this. I want to ask what made you want to work in this space and why should all us city folk give it a chance? <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, it's really fun. I, I, and I haven't really talked to anyone that isn't interested and intrigued and wanting to come. So come see us. We would love to have you all at the American. Um, I, the reason I wanted to come here is as I like got to know Teton Ridge and looked into Western sports and all that's going on in the space. One, you just feel it, Western, you mentioned country music earlier. We had actually Post Malone play at our rodeo in March and then subsequently he launched a 
effort to put out one of the more popular uh, country albums of our time. And I, you know, I was either a genius to be ahead of that or a fool <laughs> to be behind it. Um, but um, you know, it's just part of the zeitgeist right now, and you can feel it. We were talking also earlier about people walking through the streets of Manhattan in cowboy hats and cowboy boots. And when did you ever see that in our lifetime? But it's really happening, and I hear it from all the brands in the category, the growth that they're seeing in sales, whether that be brands like Wrangler and Stetson or um, some of the boot brands. We actually own Higher Boots, which is the original cowboy boot, and we're bringing it back to life, and it's been wildly successful in just the first year and a half that we've been in business with them. Um, so I think the reason for brands or partners in the sports community to get involved is because it's probably much larger, it is much larger than you think it is, and the audience is super rabid, the fans are super, it's a lifestyle for them, they're living it day in, day out, it's growing, and also it's really untapped from a brand perspective. So as we go out and look at, you know, how do we grow not only with the endemic brands that, like a Wrangler or a Stetson that have always been here, how do we go talk to more um, non-endemic brands like an Anheuser-Busch or a Pepsi or, you know, you know, Samsung and get them involved because there's a blank canvas here. It hasn't been oversaturated by brands like so many other sports have where it's hard to break in and make an impact. And I think our fans will, re will really get behind brands that get behind this way of life because they love it so much. So that's a lot of why I think that people should be paying attention. Well, Deirdre, thank you for your time. And you all stick around. We have one panel left. It's going to be great. But yeah. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>